what's going on with the Sons of Skeva? That's what we're going to find out today in X-19. Well, Paul is on a lot of trips. He has gone everywhere. And now it says that while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul went through through the inland country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples there and said to them, do you receive the Holy Spirit and believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard of the Holy Spirit. And he said, you know, then how were you baptized? Oh, this was John's baptism. So this is probably Apollos, right? That he was baptizing people like with water. And John says, John baptized was about repentance, right? That was all that John always said, repent. And telling people to believe in the Lord who is to come. But now we need to baptize you in the name of Jesus. Jesus came and died and resurrected. And so he put his hands on them. And the Holy Spirit came to them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. That's relaying messages from God. And there were 12 men in all. What got confusing about this is when I was reading some of the commentaries, and I'm not going to go too much into this, people you know, fight or debate about what were these people saved because they got this education from Apollos about baptism from John instead of the baptism from the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes to believers, right? We know that. Goes in our hearts, tells us the messages of Jesus, talks to us about Jesus, and helps us with the right words to say. The prophet, the Holy Spirit coming upon them and speaking in tongues and having these gifts was something a little bit different. I'm not going to get into the whole gifts things because it's very complicated. You should really talk to your pastor about it. But there's different situations. Was the criminal on the cross next to Jesus baptized? He was not. It says, if you baptize and believe, you go to heaven. But we know lots of people who never made it to baptism who still were believers in Jesus. So I'm not even going to get into the war. Don't get me involved in the war. But just know that there's sort of an understanding about whether these people that Apollos talked to would be saved. And I think the answer is yes, they would be saved. So it says that he entered the synagogue and for three months, bold, boldly, reasoning, persuading them, talking about the kingdom of God. Again, we're going to go through the Old Testament and show them Jesus is in this straight line path of what we were expecting. Just because we didn't expect it doesn't mean he was wrong. Some were stubborn and wouldn't believe and started speaking evil of the way, the way being the Christians. I kind of like this way. Like I said, it sort of seemed like a hippie term to me when I was a kid. But it, in a way, Christians is a hard term because a lot of people say they're Christians and it can mean many different things. But are you following the way, the truth, and the life? Jesus is the way. And if you're following the way, then you're following Jesus and you don't need this other term. So I kind of get it now. And I think that this term is interesting. It says he withdrew from them and took disciples with them, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. I don't really know who Tyrannus was, but he had a hall, which was probably like um, an education center, a, a school or something like that. And continued for two years so that everyone in, says Asia, but it means Asia Minor, Greeks and Jews could hear this whole message. Now we get to a very interesting story called the Sons of Sceva. And boy, this is a handful. So anyway, so God was doing extraordinary miracles, it says, at the hands of Paul. And so people were going in that and carrying away his handkerchiefs and aprons. An apron would be like a skilled tradesman cloth. So he was, you know, a working human being. So he had materials from his job. And when they stole his stuff, they would touch people with it and evil spirits would come out. People would be healed. And just the, the cloths of Paul, I still stick by with what I said before, is the fact that there is no healing robe, there's no healing aprons, that it is like the woman who reached out to grab Jesus. It was that faith, it was that desire to have Jesus heal her. And Jesus said, your faith has made you well. He didn't say my robe made you well. And I think in this case too, Paul's handkerchiefs, not a thing. They're not making people well. 
it's again their that desire and faith in Jesus is making them well. So it says that some of the itinerant, which means traveling, Jewish exorcists uh, undertook to invoke the name of Jesus. I think they were thinking that Jesus was a magic word. And so if we just say the word Jesus, we can do the same things. It's 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 uh, Harry Potter incantations, right? And it's not <laughs> that's not how God works at all. He is not a magic word to say. And so they were hoping that if they invoked the name of Jesus without believing in faith, in the way, in the way, the truth, and the life, that they could have those powers too. Oh boy. It says, evil spirits answered them. And they said, you know what? Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but who are you? In the Greek, the Jesus I know means someone, someone I've met, I've wrangled with. Paul I recognize means I've heard of you. I don't really know who you are, but who are you who's saying this to us? And the man in whom the evil spirit leapt on them mastered all and then overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Oh, wow. And became known as residents of Ephesus. And this became known to everybody in Ephesus. It says fear came on them. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled, put up high, you know, so that people would understand that the believers who were confessing, and so people who were doing this, practiced this magic art, ended up burning their books and their materials in sight of everyone. This isn't just repenting and saying, oh, I, I'm going to go a different way. I'm showing you I'm going a different way by burning my life behind me. I'm, I'm on a big diet right now. You know what I'm doing? Every time I, gr- I shrink out of a, some clothes I have, I'm, I'm giving them to goodwill. I'm not going to have these clothes anymore because I'm not going back and I'm not going to make that path easy. In a sense, that's, well, in a light sense, I'm just on a diet. They were practicing magic arts and they're burning it all so they can't go back. It said that this came to 50,000 pieces of silver. That, that would have been the value if they sold all this, but instead they're burning it. So it, it says that the word continued to increase. Wow. Isn't that a story of just how a town and people in evil can repent of what they're doing? They start out by trying to do dark arts. They're possessed by an evil spirit. They then think, oh, I can just take the words of Jesus' name and use them as a magic term. And that is not how it works at all. This is, at best, superstition or tricking people. And like I said, worse, these people are possessed by an evil spirit. Someone tried to estimate the price and said that it would have taken 160 people working six days a week for a year to earn that kind of money. So this was a lot of money. Ephesus was the home of Artemis, which is a Greek god of fertility. The other interesting thing is that people ask the question, there were so many people possessed back then by evil spirits. This is going to be the Ontario Calvary Church that I listened to his preachings. And what he said was interesting. He said is because there was so much paganism that it led people to become possessed, worshiping evil gods. And I even heard, listened to someone else that said that these gods were fallen angels, demons, and in, in pretending to be gods. Obviously, again, we don't know. But essentially, people were inviting these people into their hearts. And so they were becoming possessed because they allowed this to happen to themselves. Wow. Something to think about right there. So then it says that Paul, after all these things happened, was resolved in the spirit to go to uh, Macedonia and back through the Greek province, you know, with Athens and Corinth. And and then he says, you know what? I have to go to Rome. (laughs) He sent for Timothy and Erastus, and they stayed in Asia, going to be, again, Turkey, Asia Minor, for a while. And a a disturbance happened considering the people of the way. There was a person named Demetrius, and he was a silversmith, and his whole job was making idols to Artemis in Ephesus. Like I said, Ephesus was the headquarters of Artemis. And it said that it brought no little business to the craftsmen, meaning it brought a lot of business to the craftsmen. I wish Luke wouldn't use these negatives, but we get it. And so he went and got all the other workers who were doing similar things to he that he was doing. He's like, you know what? We are rich because of our job. And not only that, this Paul guy is persuading a lot of people to turn away and saying, God's made by our hands, 
are not gods. Well, you know, real shocker, right? You can't make gods with your hands. And so there's a danger, you know, we could be poor, that Artemis could be counted as nothing, that she may be disposed in her magnificence. And I think that if you think, like I think, Jesus is God, he's not going to get disposed. You know, people are like, oh, you know, the church is, is dwindling. What are you going to do when there's no more Christianity? I'm like, there's not going to be a point when there's no more Christianity. He is the truth and he will be there till the very end. By them asking, what if she gets dis- deposed? It makes me think that they don't believe any more than anyone does. They just realize this is their pocketbook. And we will hear about Aratus too in Romans. When we get to Romans, he was a city director of public works. There are still um, many statues that still exist today in museums of Artemis. And it's quite a weird thing to look at, uh, for sure, because it's a very strange looking woman, uh, for sure. So it says that when all these workmen heard it, they cried out, great Artemis of the Ephesians. And they were yelling this. And the city was into confusion. I heard that they were yelling this for hours. They rushed into the theater, dragging out Gaius and Aristarchus. I hope I'm saying that right. And the Macedonians who were with Paul. And they dragged him out of this large, I think it held 26,000 people in this amphitheater. And Paul tried to go in among the crowd, but the disciples prevented him. You know, you're going to get hurt if you go there. Even the high-ranking officials who were friend of his sent him, you know, don't go into the theater. It's, you know, probably dangerous. Now it says some cried out one thing and another thing, and people were yelling and there was screaming and there was confusion. A person named Alexander, who the Jews had put forward and said to calm the crowd down, don't have a riot here. And people recognized him for a Jew. And for about two hours, it says they all cried out in one voice, Artemis, uh, you know, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And the town clerk then quieted the crowd, made sure that what he was saying is not speaking for the city, that Ephesian is all about Artemis and the sacred stones that fell from the sky. Supposedly there was a stone, fell from the sky, and it is what meant, you know, so a giant stone fell, it was probably a meteorite, something like that. And then the shrine was related to this. It was, you know, meant to be a sign of Artemis. It said that, you know, The clerk is trying to calm people down. Alexander couldn't cut me. And he says, look, you know, you should be quiet. Don't do anything rash. These men neither robbed anything. They haven't blasphemed the goddess or anything like that. And if the craftsmen all want to talk grievances about anybody, the courts are open. The proconsuls are there. You know, talk to the officials. You can press charges. But don't start this madness, this rioting, this yelling and screaming. And because the Romans, you know, probably wouldn't allow it. If they were charged with rioting, everyone would be in trouble. So let's all calm down. There's no reason for this. He dismissed the assembly. He wasn't standing up for Paul, but he was trying to get it so that the Romans authority didn't start, you know, cracking heads there. So he just tried to calm them all down. One of the commentaries said they were probably even worn out from their two hours of yelling. And that ends Acts 19. This was a really action <laughs> chapter for sure. And so what I'm going to meditate on about how people will try to use God as a token, as an image. I'm going to say these magic words. I remember someone in college once told me that, you know, if he thought he was going to die, he was going to call on the name of every God he could think of, hoping that one of them would hear his call and save him in heaven. You know, and he felt that was enough Christianity for him. God is, Jesus is not a token. He's not a magic word. And we have to always remember that in our own lives. Not that we take it as magic, but that we understand that the way, the truth, and the life is about something much more than magic words or magic tokens or saying the right words in prayer. This is about a relationship, a following of Jesus. And so I'm going to meditate a lot about that. And what I'm going to pray about is that I never find myself in that position where I feel so threatened by something that it leads me away from God, I guess. You know, these people had their livelihoods threatened, and so they didn't want to hear about God, but they were threatening to destroy the messengers of God because money was more important. Their jobs were more important. Not that they cared about, I think, Artemis quite 
at, at all. And what I'm going to share with others is this fact that Jesus is about the relationship, about this connection that we have to Jesus. He is our Lord. We are his followers. We are to take up the cross. To turn Jesus into a token is, is really underestimating exactly what is going on with Jesus. And I'm going to share that with other people. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to subscribe, tell a friend, and share this with someone else. I hope to get more people listening to this podcast and that they too can get a lot out of this Bible study. Have a great weekend.